You're listening to a podcast by Lance Lambert Ministries. For more information on this ministry, visit lancelambert.org or follow us on social media to receive all of our updates. We're continuing our series of testimonies from our brothers and sisters around the world. This is in preparation for the audiobook release for the testimony of Halford House, which Lance wrote, called Let the House of God Be Built. The audiobook will be released later this month. In this episode, we'll hear the testimony of Philip Wiles, a servant of the Lord and a missionary in Italy. Our brother shares with the saints at Halford House his testimony of the work of the Spirit in him and through him in Italy. Let's listen. Because the questions very often bring out things that we don't talk about when we give a talk. Um, I really don't know what I I have to say here tonight, but I understand that some of you would like to hear something about my testimony, Uh, and possibly it's quite a good idea. Because missionaries are not born missionaries. We don't come become missionaries, as someone says, by crossing the seas. Um, a missionary is nothing unusual. He's just a man, like anyone else, flesh and blood. Even of Elijah, it was says, he was a man of flesh and blood and like passions as ourselves. So how much more am I like you? Uh, we have our moments when we feel we are no good at all. We have our moments when we might have packed up and come back. So I'll start from the beginning as best I can. I was in Italy during the war days, and like many of the military, the soldiers, went through the Eighth Army campaign and never thought anything about going back to Italy. However, I will say this, that while I was in the army, there was lurking at the back of my mind the thought, and quite a predominant thought, that somehow I wasn't my own. Somehow God had a claim on me. And when God speaks, if anyone is seeking the the leading of God, there's absolutely no doubt. There may be a doubt at the beginning. You may not be sure whether it's you thinking the thoughts or whether it is the Holy Spirit. If it is of God, I can say absolutely it will increase and you will have no peace until finally you either accept or reject. And there is a terrible possibility that God may leave you in peace and never speak to you again about that but it will be a peace that will be interrupted at the end. And I thank God that when I was in the army, um, towards the end, I had to do some hard thinking, and I thought, now, if I am going to serve the Lord, as I'd already spoken to my family, my mother, uh, I said I felt that God was calling me to Christian service, I realized that before I was demobbed, I had to make my decision. And that was in 1940, 45, 45. And at that time, I was stationed in the extreme northeast of Italy, near Trieste. And I was stationed in a lighthouse, strange to say, in a lighthouse. Previously, I was at a big barracks in one of the nearby towns, and we enjoyed good Christian fellowship, and the uh, Christian soldiers on a Sunday evening would take over the uh, YMCA, or the Nafi bar, as we used to call it, and... uh, we would stand up and sing our choruses and someone would play and another testify and we were enjoying how good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then one day, as it can happen, I suddenly was uh, uh, sent away from this group of good Christian friends down to the most remote, desolate place possible. It was a day in the winter, I can't remember exactly what month, but it was foggy and dismal, and the further we went and the longer we went, the more I was saying, well, what, what is the purpose of this? Finally came to a lighthouse, right down on the coast, and there were seven of us. And for months it went on like this, until one day I suddenly felt a, a burden, a burden, a thought rather than a burden. I thought I'd give a gospel of John to the woman who does the washing for us. started just from an insignificant little thing. I thought, I don't know what her reactions are going to be. I was afraid, I can say, on that occasion. I thought, well, I don't know what her reactions are going to be. However, I said, if you'd like to take this book, I didn't speak Italian, just a few words, and she took it, and that was that. Next day, she came to me, and she said, you remember the book that you gave me? And I thought, oh, that's done it. And she said, my husband saw it last night, and he read the whole book. And he said, uh, she said, as best she could explain, would it be possible for him to have a Bible? Well, that just took my breath away. And I thought, well, how can I get a Bible for him? I got a Bible through the Christian, Italian Christians, a few Italian Christians in a nearby town. And then there was a problem. The man didn't know how to read the Bible, where to start or where to begin. 
And every evening I used to go down into that kitchen in that lighthouse and I had my Bible in English and he had his Bible in Italian. And it was an object lesson right before my eyes. I saw the old local farmers come in and smoking their old clay pipe it may be or someone else doing their knitting. Uh, there wasn't all that reverence. Uh, but they were just sitting around and gossiping and as the lighthouse keeper read from the Bible every now and again they would look up and say, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. And there I was sort of looking and looking and listening and seeing and night after night when I went there it got more and more um, obvious to me what God was saying did you see what's happening you can you see these people here these are, are, are people that uh, can be spoken to they are people that I love they have a need they haven't anyone who can teach them and it got more and more obvious However, we try to act like Jonah sometimes, and I, 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 I feigned to not understand. I pretended not to understand what God was saying to me. However, in my correspondence back home, I wrote to my father and said what had been happening. Um, and lo and behold, a letter came, which was a confirmation and an unsought for and undesired confirmation. My father said, very thrilled to hear about what is happening out there in Italy. Who knows that God is not calling you to serve him in Italy? And that word just seemed to hit home. And I thought, well, I don't know how. It's all right to be here in the army with armored cars about, with soldiers, with troops, and I felt <coughs> secure. And Satan sometimes pictures terrible things before us. Talk about fear. He said, no, you, you're here surrounded by your, your friends. If you come back here, you'll be all alone have to walk along these streets alone there'll be no one with you how will you manage you don't know the language you don't know this and that but when God speaks he speaks and I should remember one day I spoke to the lighthouse lighthouse keeper and I told him you know I said I, I, I believe that God is calling me back to Italy and um, I said I have to go to Udine this is a nearby town to a little group of <coughs> Christians and uh, I, I'm wondering whether I should try to speak in Italian and that man he just sort of gave me in typical warmth of Italian gave me his hand he said if you come back to Italy he said I'll be right by your side I'll stand by you he said we could do with a hundred such missionaries he said uh, you must come and he encouraged me I was quite surprised praise God that man's still living he's not very very far along with the Lord but he's still a friend of ours and we know him so in the lighthouse a miracle happened one day uh, coming back on the lorry one of the workers, one of the seven workers there, he turned to me and he said, oh, there's a question I want to ask you. A question which, by the way, I don't get now, any longer. He said, uh, what's the difference between your religion and ours? Now the Italian is not interested in religion. He's just interested in reality. If he's seeking anything at all, he's, he's not interested in religion. You can have any religion you like. But if there is reality, and that reality is in a person, then he's interested. I don't get these questions any longer now. But then I did. And uh, so I said to him, well, if you're interested, you come up to my room. I had a room to myself, and I said, I'll be happy to speak to you. And he did. He came up every day, and he got converted. And uh, we prayed together, and we knelt together in that room. The lighthouse keeper, too, had an experience. And uh, he did undoubtedly have an experience at that time with the Lord. And we used to meet together for <coughs> prayer and for praise and singing some of the hymns. And that is where I heard the call of God, in the lighthouse. We've been that, back to the lighthouse, of course my wife has, my sister Molly, she's been back, and every visitor that comes to that part of Italy goes down to the lighthouse. We don't go down to the lighthouse for a pilgrimage, we go down for a very mundane thing, it's a beautiful breach there, and there's no tourism and no one knows about the place, so we go for swimming and we go to just enjoy it on a private beach. But going there we've met this lighthouse uh, keeper who has still been there. And every time I see that lighthouse, I feel, Lord, that's symbolic. That lighthouse, to me, speaks of what you have been doing in these 23 years in Italy. Then the time came to keep our promises. After I'd been back in England four years and had a time of preparation in Bible school training and also in mission work, the time came when the Lord renewed his vision. As he did with Sarah, he visited Sarah as he promised. And when God visits a person you can't just sit still and the Lord says now what about Italy and I thought well I'm talking about Italy here in England I'm going round to churches and I'm telling about the need and the Lord says no you you've got to go back and we made the decision it wasn't an easy decision because I was in a mission and I had a salary and we were quite comfortable we lived here in Richmond so uh, this is my hometown 
And um, then we had to face the question and the council of the mission, a very nice mission, a very good mission, a mission that we've never lost fellowship with in that sense, but they came to me and they said, well now, what is your decision? Uh, if you're going to stay with us, we want to know, because we've got our program and we've got our itineraries to make out. If you're not going to stay with us, then let us know. Well, that's that. And it came to a day, Friday of that particular week, I had to meet the mission council. And all during that week, we had a special time of prayer and praying. And when it came to the actual day, there was just no doubt whatsoever. The word of God was so clear. It was all on trusting him and going out in faith. People warned us and said, you know, you've got a child. We had a son. Uh, 18 months old, just a baby, and said, well, you know, it's a big responsibility and you're going to go out and you won't have a salary and you won't have anyone to take care of you and all this, and uh, like Abraham, going out not knowing whither. And the Lord spoke to me and said, now if you want to go to Italy, and you want to be free to do my will, I don't say this is for everyone, I'm not laying down a rule, I'm just talking my personal testimony. He said, you've got to pay the price, there's a price to pay. You just can't go out and expect men to back you in everything you do. Uh, you must be willing to follow me, cost what it may. And I thank God for the price, because it keeps us back and back again. And when we've got away, and there's things have gone wrong, automatically we've come back to the Lord, and we've had to examine our lives. And so 23 years ago, we started out that way. 23 years, and God has been faithful. First years were very... Uh, adventurous experiences. We went to the north of Italy, to the Trieste area, and started out in a little house, just a very small place, um, very unknown. The local priests then were very contrary, hostile. They said, Luther has come and he's, he's living under the shadow of the church steeple, and all this sort of thing, and we were ostracized and looked suspiciously at. As, it, the first years were very, very different to what they are now. <coughs> I used to go everywhere on, on my bicycle, which I suppose ought to be in the museum by, by now. Uh, in all sorts of weather, I can say that, yeah, it's right to say that. Sometimes 20 degrees below freezing, it's very cold in that part of Italy at times. Paper around my legs, paper inside here to keep warm. And This was part of our life. Uh, once a week I always used to cycle out to a town about seven or eight miles out once or twice still further. And, Cycling was part of my life, and I used to stop people along the road with an excuse for this or that and start up a conversation and got into any number of homes. I had a lot to learn. Uh, we got into a number of homes, and I used to go to these homes and take the knowledge of the Bible every week, but I got nowhere. I got nowhere. Didn't see conversions, really good conversions. Uh, one or two people came round and professed interest and never seemed to get anywhere. And this went on for some time until eventually we moved house and we did start one or two meetings in our homes. A very motley crowd. People that came and afterwards found that they were not loyal, not true, saying one thing to us and saying another thing behind my back. I was a bit comforted recently thinking about C.T. Stubb, some of his conversions, his conversions are conversions that he had in Africa in the last 17 years of his life, the early conversions were far from satisfactory and they had to reorganize uh, their whole activity in order that God might bless. Keodi's first conversions were far from uh, good conversions. They were utter disappointments and knowing these facts, it's a little bit comforting. However, the real thing began to move about 13 or more years ago when we were due to have a campaign uh, a very good man of God from Switzerland, Italian speaking, over the Easter period. And uh, I felt for the Lord that it wasn't right to invite, invite this man to come and speak without at least preparing the, myself in prayer. So I decided to go down to the little church that we had organized there. And we had a church building because the group that met in our home couldn't be contained and neighbors were beginning to complain and we felt we had to move out and have this church building. And as I prayed week by week, the Lord spoke very uh, sweetly, but very really. He said, pray for yourself. Uh, if this campaign is going to be a blessing, uh, you're the one. You pray for yourself. And as I began to pray for myself, it was really a, a, a terribly humiliating experience. I think I can say this. The experience I've had missionary work has been an undoing experience until the present day. 
It's by, being, by no means being glamorous. Uh, I don't know how to say these things. There have been times when I've been uh, in the seventh heaven. There have been times when people have been so grateful for the ministry. There have been times when they've put me on a pedestal. They've come and run after me and they've come and sought counsel. And the more they've done this, the more wretched I've felt. And I thought, Lord, but how can they be blessed if I'm like this? How is it? And I've asked the Lord, don't bless people if I'm going to be a failure. And uh, this is all the battle of a missionary. Missionary, shall we say, anyone who's serving the Lord. The uh, loneliness, the isolation, the uh, somewhat position of Christ, except he was without sin, where the disciples themselves didn't understand. They were walking with him, and Jesus was in the little company of disciples, and he wasn't known. And I've spoken to other people like this, and they've been comforted, other servants of God. And they've corroborated, they've confirmed it. They said, yes, sir. I didn't think anyone else knew these experiences. The awful isolation. You see, you preach, you stand before people, and the people only see you on the platform. And they see you under the anointing of God. And they see you blessed of God. And they hear the word go forth, and that's their ideal of the person. But they don't realize that for every hour here, there's 23 hours in the rest of the day. And there's times when we're alone, and there's times when Satan attacks us. And there's times when demon forces and the powers of darkness and black magic are practiced against us. You should never forget a time, I just say this in parentheses, when we had a, a, almost a fatal accident. Coming back one day from a, a happy visit, and the car went against the trees and nearly went over into the ditch as I tried to avoid right in the middle of the road. Um, um, a calf. Excuse me, I was thinking in Italian. A car. Oh, Vitello, see, that's what you say in Italian. I was going to say Vitello, but you wouldn't have appreciated that. And uh, this was on the road, and I thought it was a, a bag of paper, uh, of um, sort of one of the containers of, say, uh, potatoes or something like that, and I, I saw this thing on the road, and it was going quite fast, and the man was flashing his lights trying to warn me, but he blinded me, and I went against it, it went against the trees, and we had a lot of damage to the car, had three children, small children, not my own, that I was taking with me, and the husband and wife. And the witness said it was only a miracle. I thought, this man is going to kill himself and me and everyone else here. And he sort of shut his eyes, <coughs> and he was amazed to see us on the road. Afterwards, we had, I, I'm not a visionary, but I do believe in visions. We had someone visiting, uh, visiting us who had a vision, and she saw clearly two people pra practicing uh, black magic against us in that area. Strange to say, this might be a scandal to some people. They were two nuns. And uh, she said, now I know why certain things are happening. And I believe it. I believe it. But the Lord kept us on the road, literally on the road. That's a physical thing, but he's kept us on the road spiritually. So I was praying for this campaign, and the undoing began. And then after weeks of, of humiliating experience, the same voice of the Spirit said, now it's not all up. Don't despair. There's an answer. The Spirit of God. Now, uh, no one had sort of pumped me or, or forced me or told me what to do along these things. I knew there were such people as Pentecostal people. I preached down in the church uh, about ten years previously in Rome, in the Pentecostal church, and I felt extremely uncomfortable. Um, I didn't understand their way. Uh, I didn't understand their ejaculations, because the Italian Pentecostal people are, are, are noisy people. Um, they're noisy in any case. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I tried to put a few sparks and fire into the preaching. I thought, well, that would, that would uh, convince them. And uh, the pastor there, he, he invited me to preach. But I just felt uncomfortable, to be perfectly honest, and never thought any more about it. But during the years, we used to have a, quite a number of soldiers staying with us in northern Italy. Just very humble boys doing a military service. And they would come into the home, and many of these were Pentecostal boys. I shall never forget how their presence, just sitting at the table, having a meal, or just being in the home, was a challenge every time I saw them. Uh, to, one, to, to such an extent that one of them, very lovingly, but he said to me after a Sunday morning service, he said, Brother, you know, if you were baptized in the Spirit, you would have so much more power in preaching. And I could have been very offended, because I, uh, people came to listen to the preaching. And uh, I could have felt, well, who are you to tell me that? And he had only done the second class, elementary class, as we say in Italy, second or third. But I, I knew that he had said something. I thought, 
I would be foolish to reject the testimony of just a humble person. He spoke to me. And all this was going on in that period. And the Lord said, seek the Spirit. He didn't say, seek tongues. He didn't say this. He said, seek the Spirit. The quickener, the reviver, the one who can do all God's work. The Holy Ghost must do God's work. We can't. And uh, I began to seek the Holy Spirit of God. Now this may be a very terrible and solemn warning. And the Lord answered, or was going to answer, but I wasn't ready. I was in my home there in Udine at that time. And uh, one day this same uh, Pentecostal boy came and visited us. It was Easter Monday, I can still remember it. And we sat at the table, he one end and I the other. And we started to speak and I felt he just fixed me. He looked at me and I was afraid. I was afraid. And as he uh, looked at me and he uh, was praying obviously in his spirit for me, something happened. Now, I'm not sensational in that sense, but I felt a warmth coming over my whole body. Something strange. A warmth. And I felt, Lord, who knows, what, what's happening to me? Now? Are you going to fill me with your spirit? Or, or is it something of the devil? And all this sort of reaction. And I put my fist on that table, just like that. And I held tight for about two or three minutes. And as it came, it just went. The moment it gone, the moment it had gone, I knew that I grieved the Spirit. I knew that it was of the Lord. The moment it finished, my wife now, of course, she's here. She was in the kitchen and my other sister, and I thought, what will they think? Supposing something happens to me. Supposing I begin to speak in tongues, all this fear. And I thought, uh, Lord, no, 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 not here. And I said to this boy afterwards, I said, um, you know, I feel I grieved the Spirit. And I, I told him the reason. So we decided to go down to the church. If you miss God's time... You can stay for 10 hours and 10 years and nothing will happen. We went down to the church and we prayed and we prayed for hours, not minutes this time. Nothing happened. The campaign came. It was a total failure. This visit of this boy was just before the campaign and it was the answer to my prayers. The preacher came. He was a good preacher. We had a good choir. We had everything. We had just no results at all, as far as I know. No doubt God's word will not return void, but he didn't give us anything in that church. Rather, it was a withdrawing. For two months afterwards I preached until I just dried up, literally dried up. And I'm not exaggerating. I had nothing to say. I didn't know what to preach. I was dried up. I used to stay up to three o'clock, four o'clock on a Sunday morning preparing agony because I always tried ahead of conscience not to preach for preaching's sake. To stand before people and not have a message is a terrible experience. And it was an agony until I just had nothing to give. And then the fatal thing came. I didn't intend to give this testimony, but I will do, for the word of God. Uh, the Lord speaking to me and saying, I must do it. I uh, was sick and I had TB. And that was the last limit. And never would I have thought that I should have had such an awful, horrible disease. Such a loathsome thing. It seemed to be like a, a, a curse upon my life. And for eight months, I was in this state of up and down. And I nearly lost my life over that business. Until the Lord healed me miraculously and wonderfully and when the Lord heals he heals and sometimes I have to remember that I have had certain things for the life that I'm living and the hours that I'm keeping and all that the Lord is enabling me to do now I'm going to remember what I preach tonight the glory is his it's not my energy it's not my strength it's the Lord's doings and if anyone is discouraged tonight he can do it for you what he's done for me this happened all those years ago and praise the Lord for this miracle but then you know the Lord is good and he doesn't keep his anger forever and within the year the miracle came. I was invited to a convention and the dear brother, the Lord bless him, it was an American servicemen's convention with their wives and families. He very lovingly said, now you know you may not be used to this, you don't know, but if you should hear someone say hallelujah or praise the Lord, he said, don't be worried. He said, it may be just a little bit different. He didn't have said any of it. When I got into that place, do you know what hit me? It was just the warmth of the love of God. Perhaps we are getting used to this wonderful blessing. But you know, coming from an arid, dry sort of church where the hymns in more or less are put up on the board and the verses you're going to sing and the person that's going to pray and everything's just detailed and we're afraid to go out of that order. Coming from that rather rigid atmosphere where the word of God was preached, I am not discussing that, it was preached faithfully, it seemed all new and I found myself saying, but Lord, then such people do exist. You still have this sort of warmth that I've always believed should exist. 
I've always believed it. And it was there that God began to work, and he finished the work after us. Never shall I forget that night when the Spirit of God came upon me. And if Moody said, take your hand off my life, Lord, because he was almost dying for the joy of the presence of the Lord, I felt I had to say the same thing. And I thought, Lord, if this is heaven, what will it be to be with you? If this is any foretaste of heaven, I felt I could love everyone and everything. You know, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. If you feel cold, <coughs> if you feel cold, it's because there isn't the love of God shed abroad by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives us the love of God. And going back from that convention, I came back with the presence of the Lord in my heart. Now things began to move. The church got split up, and people went away because they didn't want to stay any longer in such an atmosphere. Some disagreed, and some were offended, but some remained. And out of that little nucleus, the work's gone on, and my wife was blessed, and others were blessed, and the family, and it spread, and it spread, and it spread. From that time, without any seeking on my part, I got a visitor from a brother down in Rome, from the Assemblies of God. I am not denominational. I refuse to become denominational, even if I'm working with the Assemblies of God in Italy. I'm always um, thankful to be able to say that I had my good upbringing and my background in the evangelical churches in, I in England, and I, I visit all the churches, and I believe we must maintain this. Cost what it must. We must. It's a scandal. It's, a, it's offensive to the Lord, the idea that God is the God of a denomination. He is the God of his church. Yeah. Uh, and it's wonderful to, to, to move about freely. And I believe that's beginning to, to make its way into God's people. However, this brother came and he said, Brother, we've heard of what's happened here in Udine. He said, we can't offer you very much. We can't offer you great intellectuals. We can't offer you this or that. But we can offer you a family of Christian people if you are happy to collaborate with us. And I said, Amen, I believe this is of the Lord. And for 13 years, or 12 years, we have been working together with the assemblies all over Italy. And we have about 650 or more churches, and we have a very large membership and a great youth, camp, uh, uh, a great youth work in our assemblies. And I do believe that God has willed this up until now. In fact, um, we can say that during this time, uh, I can say of my own personal experience, uh, where there, as there was the undoing, there has been the building up. And though I haven't been conscious of it myself, others have been conscious. Uh, people might say, well, now what difference has all this made? Some of you may be even <coughs> dubious about the wisdom of, the, of this so-called baptism in the Spirit. You may say, well, I don't know what it means. I've heard people testify. Has there been any difference? Has, have you felt any advantage from this? Um, and I can say that when I was seeking this experience, which really has divided my missionary life, I wasn't seeking it for something uh, personal to be caught up in, into some sort of rapture state. I was seeking it exclusively for the Church of God. I was exceeding it. I can remember the prayers that I prayed. Lord, Italy needs something more than just words. Youth needs more than words. This country, this nation at this critical hour must have more than preaching. And uh, I, f I knew that I hadn't got what was in the Word of God. And the Lord has done it, uh, is doing it, shall we say, he's doing it. Many years have gone by, and some of the things now that I look back on, I can say I would never have had faith before the baptism of the Spirit. I would never have had faith to pray for a person for their healing. Just one trivial example, it almost makes me ashamed now, this same uh, Pentecostal boy that was so zealous, I, I've <laughs> since visited him and stayed in his home, and now we can rejoice together. Um, <laughs> because he, he, knew, he knew what I went through. <laughs> one day he came and Sylvia, I think it was, uh, uh, she was only a baby then, she, oh, one of the children had toothache. And uh, he said, Brother, shall we pray for her? And I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. Uh, I, I, I felt, I just didn't know, pray for a child that has toothache. I said, uh, no, I said, uh, we'll give her an aspirin, something like that. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. You see, it seems, it seems ridiculous. Don't bring God into a thing like that. And, uh, of course, you cannot. Now, my wife is here. One example we can say, we can say this safely now because it's a period concluded. It's always best to talk about a thing when it can't be spoiled. This cannot be spoiled because it's finished, this period. I don't know, I can't remember the last time we ever called a doctor into our home. We've had some fatal things happen in our home. One day Peter came running into the kitchen and my wife had uh, some boiling water in a saucepan. He went against her and it went over his face. And you can imagine the shrieks and the weeping. And in that moment Satan said, now, now you see, 
you won't be able to give your testimony any, any longer in the church. Uh, now you've had it. Well, we put him on the bed, and first instinct was perhaps to, who knows, call a doctor, do something. Now I thought, well, I get out the first aid book, where I got one needs wisdom, and we saw whether we should cover or not cover his face, and so on. And then we went and knelt down, husband and wife, and we just prayed. Child went to sleep. Went to sleep. After half an hour, he woke up. He says, uh, oh, uh, mummy, can I go and see the television? It was in our neighbor's house then. Uh, child, uh, the children's program. Oh, I said, if you feel you want to, you, you go. Mm. And he had a tiny little sign, just almost invisible. Next day, he was perfectly normal. Another time, the same boy, and I think that Satan really persecutes people at times. And uh, he fell off a concrete wall in the courtyard downstairs. And we heard a sort of a de dead thud, and then he was brought up and sort of vomiting, and who knows, I thought, a terrible thoughts came, and I thought perhaps something's happened inside. And we laid him on the bed and we prayed for him. And the Lord completely healed him. As in his case, so we could say in, in my case, and in, on one occasion my wife prayed for me when I had a slip disc, and people said, you've got to, you've got to be operated, there's no other way. And, and I thought, well, Lord, you are either a healer always or never. It's all the time or nothing. I couldn't be one thing or another. And uh, she prayed for me one Sunday morning. She didn't want to pray for me. She said, I know you'll walk again. I, it was a half an hour. It took me just to fall out of bed. And the only position I could get in, strange to say, was on my knees. Anyway, I was there. <laughs> and uh, I was kneeling. And it was a Sunday morning. And Satan said, now where's your healing message going to go? You won't be able to talk about me healing, a God healing. You won't be able to say anything. And she prayed for me. And then my wife, it's not always easy to buy, obey wives. And it says, uh, wives obey your husband. But she said, well, now do something that you couldn't do before. She said, raise your hand, raise your knee. And I was doing gymnastics before my wife. And, she said, <laughs> and the Lord healed me, healed me. And I never had, uh, never had have any, any care or medical care at all. He's healed me. So you see, that's just one aspect. The healing aspect isn't the greatest by any means, but it is a very precious aspect. And uh, as missionaries, that means also that we didn't have to spend any money. Italy is the country that spends more money on um, chemists and uh, medical care than any other nation, so I understand. It's a country of chemists and it's a country of pharmacy and it's a country of all this expenditure. And it's a testimony in a country like that to be able to say, well, the Lord's our healer. Thank God that in the church we've also had um, experiences where we've been able to pray for young people and encourage them to go out and pray for people to receive the baptism of the Spirit. And many hundreds have, and this is no exaggeration. One occasion we went down to the south of Italy, I was alone and I went to the church in, in Calabria where there's a very fine pastor. You know when God moves, he does move. After two days in that church I felt rather uh, down and I, I thought, well I haven't come a thousand kilometers just to preach. <coughs> I said to the pastor, you know, I don't want to come all this way at your expense and sacrifice to others just simply to preach. I said, you can, you've got preachers here, we must see God move. You know, we must see God move, brethren, you've got to see him move here continually always if God doesn't move don't let us get used to preaching without seeing God move that's terrible and God moves in answer to prayer so the pastor and myself we prayed from that day something happened we went up into the mountains to a little village little uh, little hamlet almost and uh, there was a very humble uh, country woman there that she she did and this might be a good testimony perhaps as to what people are willing to do in Italy she emptied one room put all the furniture for the meeting into another room and we met in the, in the front room. She only had two rooms. And the Spirit of God began to move. At the end of about an hour's meeting, one young man had a, a vision. Now the program was detailed for the next hour in another church about a few kilometers away. And my um, uh, friend who was conducting me on this sort of mission, he said, uh, you know, brother, we ought to be going now. And I thought, now, Lord, we, we've prayed and we've longed to see you move and you're beginning to move. Uh, can I honestly go when you're moving? And uh, I said to him, you know, brother, the Lord is moving here. And fortunately, he was taught of the Lord. He said, that's okay with me. He said, it doesn't matter. I said, even if we get late, the Lord will take care of it. And we got an hour late to the next church. And they were all sitting there just reverently waiting. And the next church, the fire fell. Brethren, it was, it was without any laying of a, on of hands as far as I know. I may have done, but it was the fire that fell. And God moved one after another. In, in, in young, one young person who is now our son-in-law, never would I have thought it then, and uh, <laughs> uh, one or two others. It was a move of the Spirit of God. The Lord is good unto those that wait for him. 
We are too clock conscious. We are too time conscious. And if you go to see God moves, uh, I remember sister said, you cannot pray and keep your eye on the clock at the same time. <laughs> no, no, you've got to pray and you've got to let God move as he wants. And you know that is one thing in Italy that we are not bound in very many cases by the clock. People are hungry for God. I've seen them stay until, until midnight. I've seen them stay until late hours. Let me just give you one example. Um, in a mission that I had recently in Catania in Sicily, every night at 11.30 or 11 o'clock, the young people would come up from the church for a time of prayer, beginning at 11.30. And we prayed through to midnight, to one o'clock in the morning, sometimes to two o'clock, not for a day, but for nearly a month consecutively. And you know, God is moving amongst those young people. They are hungry for him. Cost what it may, we say these words, but we must be willing to pay the price. <coughs> and he's visiting them. And they're moving out and things are happening. Well, this happened on that occasion in that village. And then from there, just going back to that mission in Calabria, the Lord swept through with the Spirit over 150 people. And I'm not exaggerating. About 150 people. One man closed down his shop. Never would he do that because money is short. But he closed down his shop. He heard what has happened and he said, uh, I must seek the blessing of the Spirit. I can't just be here and working knowing what's going on. And he shut down his shop and the Lord baptized him and his wife. One day someone came in to me and said, you know the latest news? The Holy Spirit has fallen on the Sunday school. All the children are there with their hands up and they're praising God with tears streaming down their cheeks. You know, I've never seen a thing like that. Little children praying and weeping. This has only happened, oh, it may be just a, 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 about two weeks ago. We were in a, in a church and... Uh, it was in a country area, very isolated, just a, a church with barely any buildings around. People came out with lamps and, and torches, and it was quite a romantic sort of setting. They just came, and I didn't know where they came from, but they filled that little building. And it was the last night of a mission. And uh, I said, now, Lord, what am I going to preach? And I really didn't know what I was going to preach until the last moment. And then I preached, and I said, tonight, brethren, something unusual is going to happen. I'm going to preach two messages. Man proposes and God disposes. And I uh, said, I'm going to preach one, then we'll sing something, and then we'll have the second message. So I preached the first message, and then I said, we'll sing. I called us that you know, yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. We sang it once, and we sang it again. From that point onwards, I can't tell you what happened. All I know is, the Spirit of God swept over that little country church. I couldn't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> <laughs> the Spirit of God was moving. I saw people with their hands up to heaven. Saw, saw young children for an hour, for a whole hour, they stood in that position. And the pastor there, he said, you know, if this was not of God, where could you see, he said, young people, teenagers, stand there under the power of God and just pray and weep and open their hearts. And when God moves, you're, you're, you're scared. There's a sense in which we must have a holy fear of God. Fear without slavedom, a reverence. And when God moves, you sort of feel, Lord, I must stand back. I think we want to see more of this. It's a holy work, God's work, brethren. But before you can do that, I know it's been very disjointed, what I've said, but I haven't intended to preach in a sense. But it's, uh, it's got to be breaking up here with you first. You know, before I was baptized in the Spirit, I was afraid to, to go out of my program. Uh, I thought I must keep to a, a sort of homiletical type of approach to a preaching and everything so correct, first, second and third point. And, um, I don't want to decry that. I think, I think an order is of God. Jesus was orderly and God is the God of order. And sometimes I might keep to that order. But more than once, God had just cut right across it. On that particular evening, the second message was never preached. No one ever asked anything more about it. <laughs> oh, I can tell you, who cared, who cared less, with all respect, I say, about a second message when God moves? And you see, we have to step down. Another occasion I was preaching down in the church where we had all that <coughs> move of the Spirit. And I shall never forget that. At one point, I was going to quote the scripture, and I seemed to read the verse backwards. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't get the words out. I seemed to be sort of tied, tongue-tied. And you know that it was, a, it was a rather fearful moment. I thought, Lord, uh, is something happening? Perhaps I'm on the verge of a, an, a breakdown. Perhaps, and I really didn't know for a moment. I, I couldn't, my mind wasn't functioning. And it was as if the Lord was saying, stop, stop. And I could only do the logical thing. I could have forced it, possibly. But uh, I said, brethren, shall we just pray? And we prayed. Thank God. I stepped down from the pulpit and went and sat by the pastor. For a whole hour, the church was just swept 
with a spirit of weeping and prayer and confession. And the Lord moved in our midst. One brand man said, I, I saw that you were embarrassed. I realized that something was happening. Thank God he gives us the wisdom to get out of the scene and let him come forward. You know, the Holy Spirit is God's order. The Spirit of God won't do anything f foolish. Don't be afraid. Don't repeat the experience that I repeated, holding your fist and saying, no, 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 oh, I would never let God do that. I could never <coughs> allow myself. Don't be afraid of the gracious Holy Spirit. He only wants to set us free, bless. The Spirit of God is in the body of Christ. And he must have free liberty, complete liberty. That's my experience in Italy. A breaking up of me personally. And for, perhaps the Lord's got still much more to do. I don't know. One thing I would like to say, in order to be more coherent, we're not talking only of the past. Now, I, I must be very guarded what I say now. I would just simply, in a general sense, say we are on the verge, a threshold, of a completely new experience in Italy. A new work that has been entrusted to us. A work that could indeed make us tremble, because it's too momentous and it's, it's far bigger than any human possibility. I cannot say what it is. Uh, as time goes by and I can correspond and send you news, then you'll understand. But it's wise not to speak more. But just remember that it's not a static experience nor a past experience that I'm presenting. When we go back in January, beginning the, at the end of January, there's this new phase and it's something that is tremendously exacting. I need all your prayers because I believe that God can move in a very wonderful way. And if I cannot say more, just be patient in the spirit. Say, Lord, uh, perhaps you can reveal to me what it is. But it's a ministry work, of course. It's all in the work of the Lord. And it has to do with soul. And I don't feel I should say anything more. But it's a new phase and something that I would never have foreseen or expected. But I, I've had to say, Lord, from the time that I said I would serve you, I cannot tell you where to send me or what to do. I must simply say, here am I. And that's all. And thank God that there's still adventure and there's still blessing and there's still new experiences even to the very end. We don't want to get static. Uh, Amy Carmichael said, let me not seem to be a clock. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. Wonderful words. Wonderful words those. And many times I've quoted it and I pray that someone tonight may take courage. I feel that what the Lord has put on my heart primarily is this. He must break us up. Before he can bless, he must break us up. All the hard ground, all our resistance, all our traditions, all our desires. Don't be afraid of his breaking. He breaks the bread, but then he multiplies it and people get a blessing. They don't want you, they want Jesus. They don't want me, what can I give to people? They want Jesus. But Jesus will never be seen in a rigid, hard vessel. He wants to break the vessels as Gideon's vessels were broken and the light shone out. So that's only my testimony. A broken person is speaking to you and someone that God has got to still break possibly. But the great thing is that at the end, we should say like Wesley, a sinner saved by grace. Not a great preacher, just a sinner saved by grace. But through the grace of God, others have seen Jesus. Amen. I hope I haven't taken too long. I haven't looked at the watch because uh, that's the way we do things in Italy. <laughs> May you be submissive to the Spirit of the Lord. May you know the deep, deep love of Jesus. <laughs>